Okay, we're live. Well, welcome everyone, bienvenidos. Uh, I am so thrilled to welcome you today to 40 at 40, a celebration of Salmon Poetry's 40th anniversary. I could not be more humbled and pleased to welcome you to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. It's a reading today that is very near and dear to my poetry heart, even though I am here with you every Sunday, uh, sharing poetry with you. Today, as I said, is our celebration of Salmon Poetry's 40th anniversary with a river of salmon poets, 40 salmon poets. Many will be reading their poem today from um, the very re recently released Days of Clear Light, a festschrift in honor of Jesse Lendeni and a celebration of salmon poetry's 40th anniversary, edited by Nessa O'Mahony and Alan Hayes. Well, I'm your host, Sandy Yanone. I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And obviously I have such incredible respect and gratitude for this amazing press, for the poetry that it is published internationally for 40 years. And personally, I can't tell you how the connection has changed my life and my connection with poets and poetry. Uh, again, I send out my love and gratitude to Jesse Lendeni, founder and director, to Siobhan Hudson, Salmon's exquisite, exquisite designer, and to all my Salmon siblings reading today, and those as well joining us today, uh, because there are hundreds of Salmon poets at this point in the 40th anniversary who have published books and prior to that in the Salmon Poetry Journal. I wanna also thank those of you who are joining us here live in celebration in our Zoom room, as well as those of you watching on Facebook. As I always say every week, please send the love in the chat today to all of our poets as they read. Well, to introduce the, my most and all of your most beloved Jesse Lendeni, who will be the kind of the navigator of today's reading, is my dear salmon sister, Nessa O'Mahony. Nessa was born and, uh, and lives in Dublin. Her poetry has appeared in a number of Irish, UK and North American periodicals, has been translated into several European languages. And she won the National Women's Poetry Competition in 1997, as well as being shortlisted for the Patrick Kavanaugh Prize and Hennessy Literature Awards, her second Poetry collection, Trapping a Ghost, was published by Blue Chrome in 2005, and a verse novel, In Sight of Home, was published by Salmon in 2009. Um, a third poetry collection, The Side Road to Star, was published also in 2009. She was awarded an Irish Arts Council Literature Bursary. She's completed a PhD in creative writing and creative and critical writing at the University of Wales. And she, and she has done so, so much as an editor, poet, and salmon citizen. And the most recent project, um, in addition to The Hollow Woman, um, which I believe is her latest salmon collection, has she has just released along with um, edited with uh, Alice Kinsella. Here it is, The Empty House from Door Press. I just wanted to give a shout out. It's just been released very recently. Uh, I was at the launch and I wanna give a congratulations to you on the publication of Empty House. Would you please all help me in welcoming Nessa. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I, I love the idea of, of being a salmon citizen. Great phrase, um, <laughs> that is me. Um, I was asked to introduce Jesse and also to just talk a little about um, salmon poetry uh, and it's 40 years 
of existence. Um, and it really started in 1981 when Jessie arrived in the west of Ireland with her then partner, Mike Allen. Um, she was born in Arkansas, but she'd been making her way poetically eastwards. Um, she spent some time in New York before arriving in London uh, and she worked for a while in the, in the poetry uh, society there. But in 1981, she, she, she came to Galway and really started a, a quiet revolution in Irish and international publishing. In Galway, she found a vibrant poetry scene um, and in the workshops and readings, she mingled with some of the most exciting new voices in Irish poetry, people like Rita Ann Higgins, Eva Burke, Mary O'Malley. But Jessie quickly found her place, starting first with the poetry journal, The Salmon. Um, Des Kenny writes in our fest shrift for, for Jessie, um, a memory her mother, his mother had of uh, Jessie arriving into Kenny's bookshop, that, that institution in Galway, brandishing this, this um, home produced uh, photocopy poetry journal, The Salmon, um, and talking about it as an alternative voice in, in Irish literature. So she had that vision from the start um, and she was determined to deliver it. Um, 1985, Salmon took its first steps into book publishing, um, producing Gunella, which was the debut collection of Eva Burke. And that was actually launched by our current Uchtaran Naheran, our president of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, who is himself a, a proud Salmon citizen. Um, that book was quickly followed by the publication of Rita Ann Higgins' first book, Goddess on the Merview Bus, which I think has still broken uh, sales records for, for, for poetry, selling in the thousands. Um, many of the people here tonight had their debut collections published by Salmon, and they, like me, are proud of being part of that family. And it made sense, given Jessie's background being from the States, that she would begin to publish American poets alongside Irish ones, as now, and now there's hardly a continent. I, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a salmon poet in Africa, but there's hardly a continent in the world that doesn't boast at least one salmon poet. But the transatlantic relationship remains especially strong. Salmon facilitates a wonderful ongoing dialogue between the poetry of Ireland and the poetry of America as this evening's celebration of Salmon at 40 will demonstrate. So over four decades, Salmon has published more than 500 volumes, as several, you know, much more than that, I'm quite sure. Several wonderful anthologies, books of essays, and even the odd bit of fi fiction. Jessie and Salmon have flown the flag for Irish and international poetry all over the world, and she continues to make opportunities for new and diverse voices. She also continues to write wonderful poetry herself. Her, her um, first collection, Daughter, is, is an absolutely beautiful book. Um, I know she's been working on a memoir for, for a while now, which we will hopefully see soon. Um, and I joined the Salmon family in 2009, so I am a comparison. but I'm so proud to be part of that family. I'm very proud of the matriarch who started it all and who continues to keep that spirit alive. Thanks for all you have done for us, Jesse. Thank you, Nessa. Thank you, my new, amazing. <laughs> I suppose it's probably getting on for 700 books now. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Um, it's hard to relate to um, personally me feeling like, you know, some sort of, um, mm, oh, I don't know, you know, never having a kind of great image of myself, shall we say, and given to depression, etc. If you look back and I think, boy, how the hell, I must have had some kind of determination. And again, you know, to be, to be able to have, to express the poetry and to be able to have poets of such amazing scope and quality. And, you know, it's, yeah, that's a, you know, it, there isn't any poetry publisher in the world who would not envy the list. 
stand on this. Um, so that's it. So fun. I'm just going to give the name, and we're starting in reverse order. The most recent, the most recent publications first, and then going through. And um, I'll read a poem myself at the end. Uh, it's my mother's birthday today, so she would be astounded. I have to say. <laughs> I mean, she's been dead for 60 years, so, you know. Anyway, okay, so I'm going to start with Ethna Hand. And I hope I can see everyone. When I'm clicking, this is a, it is a bit dodgy, the connection. And so I don't see Ethna now, but she's probably on the next page. And I don't want to try to do that because then everything goes funny. Ethna. <laughs> and her wonderful book is Fox Trousers. So, Ethna, please. Thank you, Jesse. Hello, everybody, and um, happy yeah. birthday! Happy birthday to Jesse's mom. That's a lovely um, connection because it's always a special date. Um, thank you to everybody, to Sandra, and happy birthday mainly to Salmon for forty years. And I feel so, I so feel like a baby in this bunch of citizens because it is very much feels like it's the la I was the last in under the wire, and this book was due for last year and obviously got stalled and eventually was just the highlight, obviously, of the lockdown to be able to bring out. And thanks to Siobhan Hudson, obviously, for her incredibly beautiful design. Um, it finally came out and uh, I'm going to just read a short poem so we won't, I'll be well within my three minutes. Um, so this poem is actually the poem, in, the first poem in the collection, and it actually has the title of the book, Fox Trousers, within the poem. And in a way, it's a fear of missing out poem, and it's also a midlife, maybe, and it's a sense that we all have of midsummer, even. We're all like basking in the sun here in Ireland. So it's anybody, any of the Irish readers will have the sunny faces today. Um, and it's also a bit about something that we all probably met this year, which is the uh, dying. So, summer yearn. It's almost dark in my bedroom. Outside, the lake still glows. If I could just slide from these covers and lie in the tickling grass, I'd eavesdrop on the crowd readying for the night, pulling on their fox trousers, badger coats, heading for our neighbors' hills, hares on the beat, hedgehogs on the ball, deer drinking long in the late night lake bar, mink slink through brambles as midnight's satin shifts from the east, and a liquid dark slips over us all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Edna, thank you. That, um, okay, uh, Jessamine, there you are. Hey, Jessamine. Hi. <laughs> okay. So, mm. and also a, a new baby. Um, <laughs> Silver Spoon, uh, Jessamine's uh, collection was just published as well. So, Jessamine, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, like um, like Edna, we both we had a launch on the on the same day uh, online, which was lovely. And uh, so, like her, I'm just going to read the I'm going to read the first poem of my book as well, uh, which is in it's the voice of the island of Ireland speaking to people coming to her, uh, refugees and immigrants. Welcome. I open up my craggy arms, my cliffs, this shift of whirling gulls, stretch my beaches wide, reach out my hands made of coral, stone and sand, scatter islands like roses or breadcrumbs to show you where to land. And when you're close enough, I'll lift up the rough cloth of my hedges, fields and locks, wrap its patchwork cloak around you. Gather the lush green folds and rolls of sequin blues to make an earth cocoon for you to grow in. Because when you're rested and ready to stir, it will be my pleasure to watch your wings unfold, unfurl in my cloud thick hair, sprout your new roots feet deep into my lungs and feed me your fresh air. Thank you and happy birthday, Simon. Thank you, Jessamine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Drina Nikanita. Drina. Um, happy birthday, Simon. There you are. Hey, sweetheart. Oh, 
Hello. Oh, Happy and you've got different hair. You've got different hair, too. I do. I have post-COVID hair shock. <laughs> no. The, okay. I was going to say the color as well, but... Totally different. <laughs> so kind of went mad. Beautiful. I was Hello, everybody. Poet, and, um, uh, thank <laughs> you. And we're thank delighted you. to publish Drina's first collection in English called Deleted. So... Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of She's primarily deleted. Deleted. As, as an Irish language poet, I have 10 Irish language collections, but um, I'm really, really proud of Deleted and um, Tisha Vaughan for the design, for Jesse, for encouraging me, meeting me in the AWP in Boston a long time ago and saying, in seven years time, Doreena. And I thought, that's nuts. And then in seven years time, she was born. I'm going to read a love poem because I'm in the mood for a love poem from the wilds of West Kerry this evening in the sunshine. Love on a steep cliff. Stray skulls of bird, gnarly bog oak. That's what he left behind this bare place. I sense a sentient being crossed the threshold, came and went almost unknowingly. His threads hang on my mind like rafters. I am chaffed to the bone. Cliffs unfurl, silver slivers of light slice the horizon, seagulls shiver. I oscillate to and fro between the winds of love and fear, like a demented sea nymph seeking truth in ancient rocks. Every crevice stings. Russet brown ferns reveal the ritual signs of emotional heart surgery, while soft threads of latent love grow from the ruins. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Doreen, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, now, um, Paul Ann, Paul Ann Peterson, who is a beautiful Oregon poet. Paul Ann? Yes, thank you, Jessica. Oh, there you are. Thank Hi, you. Paul Ann. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and um, her, oh, it's just Paul Ann's book is called One Small Sun. Yeah. From this salmon book, this Lucky for me, Salmon Book, One Small Sun. Here is a poem called Vocation, a poem about the vocation, the calling of poetry making, a poem that I have reshaped for today's occasion. Vocation. A purveyor of charms, I write spells on pieces of paper, then give them away. A spell to make honeybees not dwindle in numbers. A spell to bless the red of dahlias that bring bees flurrying to a garden. A chant for seeds waiting to be buried so they can rise again in leafy flourish. Songs for yeast spread, for the bit of borrowed sun in an oven's heat. Plain charms not so plain, charms that require the wind for translation. Some people inform me that no one will value what's given away. To them, I'll present my bill, a dime per charm, enough to buy pretty paper for more. Then I'll fashion the spell that makes a dime payment enough to make scoffers into believers. I'll conjure some niggling charms, one to keep those ants who yearn to live in my house outdoors, one to make the number of sunlit hours and the time tomatoes need to ripen come out even then a ring of words biting its own tail, making a circle that, that keeps all crawling creatures a crawl. Magic spelled out in blank, in black ink on a pale page. 
For today's grand occasion, I'll fashion an abracadabra of words to have all the lovely dogs in this world have the luck of a daisy, that sweet three-legged lady who came to live with the poet Jesse not long ago. Then another charm to keep salmon poetry's axis poetica going for another 40 plus years. A hub where Jesse and Siobhan can carry on with their daily wonders. May the magic of her own good work keep Jesse on the flourish, on the rising crest of joy. May the magic of poetry itself, numinous enchantment, keep the whole Salmon clan on the thrive. May Salmon poetry bloom and thrive. Thank you. Oh, Colleanne, you're so good. You're so wonderful. What luck meeting you. <laughs> wow. God. <clears throat> now another lovely West Coast poet, the, um, Northern California, my dear friend Carolyn Tipton, and her book, one in, one book, you know, she's got, another, I'm, I'm beating her into doing another one, you know, I know I have to beat all of you, um, uh, it's called The Poet of Poet Laval. Carolyn? Thank you, Jesse. This was my book. Thanks to Jesse and thanks to Siobhan's beautiful work. Thank you today to Nessa and Sandy. Um, it's an honor to be part of this and to see all of you. And thank you, Paul Ann, for your charm. May it all come true. Um, this poem is from Jesse's Fest Shrift. It was written last October. Um, at that time, Donald Trump was in the White House the global pandemic was raging, giving rise to Zoom everywhere. And California was burning up. It seemed to me then that the whole world was on fire. The poem is called Bird Bath. <clears throat> the birds haven't found it yet. I worry about them flying through air, thick with smoke from fires counties away. I thought maybe they'd want to wash their wings. So I cleaned out the old bird bath, filled it with fresh water, floated a flower as an offering. But I think I am the one who needs the cleansing, not just from smoke, but from anger and from feeling like a stone, a small center of concentric circles of sorrow. The outermost, the planet's tragedy, then our country's chaos, California's conflagrations, and at the heart of it, the inadequate translation of presence, of touching, into merely talking to a screen. I hope they find it soon. I want to see them no longer heavy with soot, but light enough to lift their wings into full spread, released from accumulated grime, able to rise up, renewed, into a sky that wishing has, for once, turned back to blue. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but we won't get a look at Ole. Ole, that, that's beautiful. Carolyn's beautiful, beautiful doggy. No. Oh, well, okay. He's there, though. He said, okay, gosh, mm, okay. <laughs> Richard, Richard Peabody, Richard, where's Richard? Oh, where's Richard? Oh no, perhaps he couldn't get on, see. Okay, it is Richard. I, I don't see him on yet. Oh, so Richard. He can come back. Yeah. Okay. 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 So Jeffrey Levine. 
Where, where have they gone? <laughs> okay, we'll come back. <gasps> Sandra Yanone, a boats for women. And that's 2019. Wow. What? 2000. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, Sandy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm actually going to be reading my poem that is also in the Press Shrift. Um, and it's a poem that took place the, the, the first time I visited Salmon Poetry. So this was before I knew Boats for Women would be published, you know, basically before, 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 before. But the, the visit to Salmon Poetry made such an impression on me and spending time in Jesse's garden made such an impression on me that that morning, I was only there for one night, um, I wrote this poem and it's called The Garden and it's the last poem, it's the last poem in the book. The Garden for Jesse. Before the day takes off, before I watch the crow lift into the morning sky, as if from out of the painting above her fireplace mantle, I step into her garden, waiting and breathe dear life into my wander lusted lungs. One wall of the garden, a wild tangle, the other an ocean of ivy, a single pink tulip skies toward the day from the ground below reminds me that the year is still early to say nothing of this morning to say plenty that i'll leave unsaid about last night's spells cast into the fire at one end of the garden an arched stone passage that leads to the building listing with books. At the other end, a studio, unfinished, a sanctuary city all by itself, between both, a door that opens to a ruin of stacked doors, each door waiting to bestow entry to somewhere other than the garden, which needs no doors. When so lovely, this singular April morning, the garden, dares in its absence of the obvious to suggest every one of her beloved anticipated stems. You know, I like to think of those doors as, as, as all the doors that Jesse has opened to poetry. And of course, all those books still yet to come as those beloved anticipated stems Happy 40th anniversary, Jesse. Happy birthday to your mom and uh, much love to everyone. I'm so already enjoying it. I've got all the warm, fuzzy feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, <clears throat> speaking of the, the garden and the, the lovely events in the garden, there was one that everyone, we got such a, a, a wonderful laugh out of. Eileen, if you remember, Eileen Sheehan. Eileen Sheehan? Eileen, I can, I can see you, Hello. but you're not moving. <laughs> I'm here, I'm moving. <laughs> <laughs> and The Narrow I, Way of Souls is her most recent book from us. Thank you, Jesse. Happy birthday to Simon. Um, and thanks to Jesse for everything. Uh, <laughs> Too much. I'm going to read from Days of Clear Light. And when, when I was trying to write a poem for the anthology, I was trying to write poems about dogs and gardens and poetry and all sorts <laughs> of things. Um, I know that it worked. And then one day this little girl appeared to me, I think, and I figured an extraordinary woman like Jessie must have been a pretty extraordinary child. So that's the one I listened to. And this is the poem. 
deciduous. Mm -hmm. There was a girl and the path through the woods was the only path. It was winter and the scene was clean and all verticals, serious green to gray to softer gray and lines of solid black, dexter and sinister, future and past unknowable. Trees sang the story of trees, their long shadows. Her hands on the skin of a tree, scarred like her knee and warm to her touch. Dark fissures for beetles to nest in. Silver scribble of lichen displaying a traceable lexicon, acid and alkaline. Squidgy green moss to the north side. Yellow lichen sang the story of air, its pure components. Stood at the base of the tree and grounded. Her feet where small creatures burrowed and foraged. Debris of autumn rotting down into earth. Leaf mold and carcass. Reduction happening so quietly. And the floor sang the story of fungus, its insatiable hunger. And the path from the woods was the right path. Footstep and footstep. And the girl sang the story of trees, the story of air, sang the story of hunger with the trees at attention. And the woods sang the song of a child. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Eileen. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Dan, Daniel Tobin. Where's Daniel? Do you know what? I think all the men have left. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Tobin? Here I am. Ah, there you are. Oh, oh I didn't say that. Jesse. Dan Tobin, yes. A stone in the air. Uh, thank you so much, Jesse, for taking a chance on uh, these translations from the poetry of Paul Celan. Uh, I'm actually going to read my poem from the Feshrift dedicated to you. Uh, and uh, this is about a holy well at Cronin's Well near Carron in uh, County Clare. And I like to think that salmon is something of a holy well for poetry. At Cronin's Well. Coins in the stone basin more in passage than in blessing where the sourceless pools from its ground below. Still they hang cloth strips here on the hawthorn, the frayed rainbow weathering to a blanched and frittering remnant. Above in the walled field, the saint also waits beneath his rock tabernacle beside the unroofed church with its figures staring rain-worn past the hazels to the sea. Walk seven times clockwise around this tufted mound, tilth core, the beads shackled lovingly between wrist and knuckle, keeping mindful of the cross, the cracked, armless, tilting stump of it that cannot be mended ever, seen whole now, only in the soul's life, beyond all manifest and measure. Thanks again, Jesse. Oh, thank you, Dan. And all at salmon. <laughs> Honored. <laughs> oh boy. Now, and this is um, Joyce Sutphin. There you are. There's Joyce. It um, has written one of my very, very favorite. And you all got, I've got, all, I've got favorite poems from all the poets. But Joyce is Joyce is only after all my harassing her. She's only published one one book with us. She's published won numerous awards around in Minnesota, all sorts of things. Other publishers have snapped her up, but we got her book called The Greenhouse, and I think I kind of cornered cornered her at AWP. The Greenhouse, twenty seventeen. But 
what I, I I just realized I I I would love for you to read next time, but that's not what you've chosen. So that's one of my very favorite poems. It just makes me cry like. But anyway, you don't have it there by any chance, do you? Oh no! Oh, it's me. Sorry. She might. This is no. This is like, I shouldn't have done that. You can ask for whatever you want, Jesse. It's okay. <laughs> she got it. Uh huh. Oh, are you? Are you? Yeah. Just can you enjoy it? Oh, unmute. 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 Okay. There you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, first of all, I want to say hi to all the salmon poets here. I, I've never, I haven't been part of such a big family since I grew up with my six brothers and two sisters, but you know. Um, and I, I'm going to read a poem from this lovely book. And somehow, Jesse, I will read next time for you on some special occasion. But I just wanted to stay in this in the salmon. I wanted to be a salmon citizen. I love that. That's one place I will be glad to be a citizen of is is salmon poetry. Um, I I want to say that it is raining here and cool in Minnesota. What else would you expect? But. Um, so I like all the sunshine coming from you. And um, I don't have any um, big connection with this poem. It's called Good. It's a little dance. It's a little dance. So I'll, I'll try to dance it to your ears. Good. I'm good at being where I should be when I shouldn't be of saying the almost right thing at exactly the wrong time. I'm good at indecision, good at leaving just as the blizzard is about to begin, finally selling that piece of land as the market crashes. I'm good at spider webs and finding tiny agates. If you lost something, I'm good at finding it where you've already looked. 20 times before. I'm good at forgetting, forgiving everything that happened. Happy just to sit with you watching clouds. I've always been good at watching clouds and listening to you talk. So just keep talking and I'll listen. I'm good at that. Thank you so much. Beautiful choice. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> okay, Brian Kirk. Brian. Jesse, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, there you Thanks are. very there much. You are. Brian, after Delighted. the fall. Yeah. Was is um that's the most recent book, anyway, you know, at the moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so thanks very much for inviting me, everybody. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and it's it's great to celebrate salmon with you, Jesse. Yourself and Siobhan were have been brilliant for me. Uh, mm -hmm. After the fall was great when it came out in 2017. Absolutely. Um, but when when Nessa asked me to provide a poem for Days of Clear Light, um, I was working on a poem at the time, and it was a poem that was important to me, Jesse. So it was the poem that I uh, subsequently gave to mm -hmm. Nessa mm -hmm. and. I, I, I hope you like it. Uh, I'm going to read it now. It's called Small Things, and it was dedicated to uh, Catherine Corliss, who most of you may know uh, from the June Babies uh, scenario. And I, I, I thought Catherine, like Jessie, is a really strong woman and an important woman in, in Irish society and in, and in our lives. So uh, while it's dedicated to Catherine, it's also for Jessie. So this is Small Things. She wraps a stone in an old sweet paper, just like she's seen the older girls do, offers it to a street of a thing from the home, watching big eyes light up for a moment before going out. 
The girl was famished. What if she'd put it in her mouth? Some say a stone sucked from time to time will trick the stomach into thinking it's being fed, releasing enzymes to work on what's not there, adding a peculiar ache to habitual hunger pangs. She often thinks of it, that meanness, a small thing that stays with her, won't let her be. Just leave it alone. That's what some people said. Why go upsetting the holy nuns? Even after she counted them out, painstakingly adding new names to the list of dead babies, the causes of death, measles, TB, hunger, pneumonia, neglect. Four euro for a certificate paid out of her own pocket, the only proof they once lived, now dead. Small lives that nobody noticed or cared about. Small deaths that deserved no more than the stroke of a pen. Not the word of a priest, a sad song from a choir, a slow walk to a grave where earth falling on oak could be the final solemn sound before the tears of loved ones filled the air and soft words telling the story of little him or her and what they liked or hated or how they smiled when the gardener's dog chased pigeons from the seeded rose in spring or how the tiny fingers curled about the handle of a spoon at summertime or how their shining cheeks went dipping in cold water at Halloween, russet as the apples in the bowl. Small things, I know. She found their names and gave them back to us, although we weren't sure, surprised to find we needed them as much as they had needed us back then, each one so small, a tiny gift, a question asked and answered with her love. Thank you. And thanks, Jesse and Siobhan. And well done, Salmon. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> hey, uh, Yun. Yun. Uh, may I share my screen? Oh, oh, oh where, is, where are you? Well, um, I don't have video, so I would like to share my screen so I can insert the picture of myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the host. You're going and the. The Book of Totality and still waiting for another book now, Ian? <laughs> yes, okay, so let me see. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so first of all, thank you so much, Jesse, for everything, for including me in the Salmon family. Um, deeply grateful to you and congratulations for this extraordinary milestone. Um, so I will read this poem that's on the screen. And so beautifully designed by Siobhan. Thank you, Siobhan. So this poem is completely different from all the other poems read here. So hopefully, you know, adds to uh, the rainbow from Simon. Black Horse. The one-eyed man pulls out a gun chuckles on screen. The banker seizes her right hand, hides it between sweaty palms. A fat merchant watched a black horse. She flew across the prairie in search of someone else. The silk of her black tail fought the wind. Sunset died the prairie. Tired of being watched, the horse allowed the fat man to take her home. He chained her to a wagon laden with sacks of salt. She reads his palms, credits stream on screen. She rushes for the door, goes home to map the sky. Constellations barely move in two millennia. She dreams of slender willows in water. A lanky man in pale silk gazes at her urns into a crane. She once played shell for a king at dusk. Ruby-throated thrushes answered from bamboos. She studied the moon's tear marks, fingered jade bed rails, considered a scholar who gazed at her and turned away. She wrote poems on white silk, burned them as the king snored. The scholar avoided her. One day he wandered a secluded path, 
thick with plum petals, eyes half closed. A purple chariot appeared. She stepped down from the chariot, bowed deeply. He blushed. To prove his innocence, he declared women petty creatures, small people without dignity. 2,000 years later, she remembers his eyes, drawn back to her as he turned to leave. Two stars refused to dim when the sun whitewashed the sky. She dreams of a black horse in water. Her tail spreads into a dark fan. She screams, wakes to echoes in an empty room. Her window opens to sunlit green peonies. The phone rings, the sword merchant invites her to another movie. She declines, unplugs the phone, tabulates exploding stars. The rain darkens, reminds her of willows. The scholar has written to request a meeting. She lights a candle, listens, to the rain. Thank you. And thanks again, Jesse. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John. Yeah. Oh, Sandra Ann Winters. There Hello. you are. Yeah. There you are. Um, and most recent book from Simon is Do Not Touch, but we can touch her. I mean, when we're allowed to you can touch the book. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, two days ago, I broke my leg, so I'm reading with a broken leg, which I've never done before. Uh, my husband and I had a house in Bill Street for 20 years, and this poem is about our early experiences of Ireland, although I return to those experiences often. And the poem is for Jesse and is included in Days of Clear Light. Pandemic. I will not see you, Ireland. I will not walk the Western coastline, hugged with islands and peninsulas. I will not stroll across the ancient corrugated lazy beds of Inishbofin and Kilcrahan. I will miss stroking the stone circle of Kinmare and squeezing into the dark passageway of Newgrange. I will miss the pubs with Michael, Siobhan, Sean, pints of Guinness, plates of mussels. As I walk across the burn, I will not photograph the golden gorse, the common spotted orchid, the tufted vetch, the dingo fishermen unloading their catch. I will miss the rain. Mm. Lovely. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Yes. Judith. Oh, Judith Barrington, Judith, Judith, Judith. She was here a minute ago. Oh, no, Judith. She was here. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Oh, there she is. Hey, oh, there you are. <laughs> I was Were you hiding, right in the middle? <laughs> I was hiding behind my little box. <laughs> And Long Love, New and Selected Poems. That's her most recent Simon book. Yes, thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> I want to say congratulations to Simon. Um, having lived for a number of years with a small press publisher, I have witnessed the work that goes into these books and I am absolutely astounded at the number of beautiful books that these two women put out. Um, then I know the, num the hours that must go into that work. And I just am totally grateful. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to read a poem uh, from, I was going to read, a, 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 it seemed appropriate to read a dog poem, but my beloved dog Yofi died a few months ago and I still can't really do it without crying. That didn't seem appropriate. So, um, and you know, I know you'll understand Jesse. Um, so I'm going to read something about, uh, I'm going to read a fun poem because that, that's what I feel like doing. It's <clears throat> from, from my selected, from Long Love. 
in praise of not knowing the names of birds. I cannot name the one with the scimitar beak and mohawk who spends all day drilling holes in tree trunks. I cannot name the enormous one with the white stocking cap on his head, hounded by glory and flags, poor devil. I cannot name the thumblet with wings that were like the new kind of dentist drill. Rupert or Rufus come to mind when I watch her at the scarlet feeder, but I cannot be sure. The flash of her arrival, too swift for color, is what matters in the long run. I cannot name the one who hoots, the one who dives from treetops, the one who stands on chopstick legs waiting for sushi. I cannot even name the caged one who calls himself pretty and mocks the world with his nasal chant, nor the big white one on the beach who stabs the rotten flesh of his dead brother. Then there are those with the red vests or speckled chests. I cannot name them either, or perhaps I simply will not. Unnamed brownish ones doze on telephone poles, hunched and grumpy as old men, while the black jacketed strut in the road, rolling like sailors and holding up traffic. I cannot name the tiny chirper who follows me along the creek, moving so fast that I see nothing of bird, nothing of shape or weight or color or sex, nothing to look up in a book if I had a book or wanted a book. I cannot even hazard a guess. She might be the spirit of my dead horse. She might be nobody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Judith. So much, thank you. Oh, golly. Kelly. Kelly Moffitt. There you are, sweetheart. Hello. <laughs> Okay, and Kelly's Kelly's most recent book with us is A Thousand Wings, and she has a forthcoming one too. So there you go, Kelly. Thank you. Wow, just such talent tonight. I feel so honored to be here. Thank you, Jesse, for making a true difference in my life. Thank you, Siobhan. Thanks to Ellie and all those in the bookshop. I guess the only thing I would like to say in preparation for this poem is that it does come from Days of Clear Light. And that in my mind, somehow Ireland poetry and Jesse all combine to make a kind of magic. And um, I think in Ireland, I've heard it pronounced lichen, but in America, we say lichen, but I heard Eileen say lichen. So I want to mention that just so people don't think I'm mispronouncing it because I'm trying to pronounce the river in Ennistimon correctly. Um, my friend Antoinette has been helping me. So if I butcher that, I'm sorry. And also uh, Shannon was one of Jesse's amazing dog companions. So Shannon appears here too. Dear Jesse, this morning in Kentucky, I knelt down to a snail as small as a semicolon and traced the trail of slime it made on the sidewalk, almost silver in the morning light and as straight as this line and I remember the snails of Ennis Diamond. There are 150 different types of snails in Ireland, but I saw them one at a time, the swirl of yellow and brown, each shell larger than a crow's egg. You may have come from America, but in the burren with the lichen and grikes and the low clouds and sea, you have become your landscape. I see you as a cliff side, a hermit's rock cave, the rough current, and sometimes as a single sentence, soaking as a tea bag in the horizon. You preserve us, so each word to the page. There are 1,165 species of lichen in Ireland. I remember one bright red in a dip of limestone. Shannon lapping up the afternoon rain that had pulled there. The reflection of her nose meeting her actual nose. 
And I thought of all the reflections you photographed in the river Ena, wondering what you see in each one. Is it a memory or a mood or is it another kind of language? My hand felt a, needle, a nettle sting for the first time as I sat in your office and watched your bare figurines lumber across the mantle. And I stared at the peat in the hearth and I thought of you as one of those strong bears. There are six common types of rock in Ireland and I believe over time, I have carried each one of them home wanting to take something back. Ireland, the landscape, for all I have come to know as you. Thank you for having me. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Where's <laughs> Shani? <laughs> Crazy Shan. Oh, beautiful poem, golly. Siobhan just told me that dear Richard has turned up. Mr. Peabody, Richard, you're gonna to have to wait till the end. Where'd he go? No. Okay. Okay. We'll get him later. Can Joe you hear me? Oh, oh yeah. there he is. Can you hear me now? Richard? Yeah, I can't see you. Yeah, I can't get the camera to work. Yourself. Just on the audio. Well, uh, start video. Start I can't. Video. My kids okay. just tried to figure it out, and uh, and uh, I don't know what's oh. going on. Never had that problem oh, before. Damn. So well, I can uh, hear you well, anyway. Richard, yeah. Richard, there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, look at the top of your keyboard across there. There probably is one little button that looks like a camera with a slash through it. Yeah. If you push that button, it will turn your camera on. You would think that, but my kids tried to do it and they know everything and they couldn't. Oh, okay. Back to uh, we went in, we tried to reboot it and you know, I could go on and on. It's just not, it's not happening. And I took a shower. I'm all set, you know? <laughs> sorry. Okay, I'm just gonna read one short poem and thank you for, uh, okay. I'm sorry I can't, Richard, can't see Richard's, Richard's most recent book with us is Guinness on the Key. So, okay, thank you, Richard. We'd have to and uh, and uh, yeah. can't believe that you have 700 books now. That's blown my mind completely out of my head. Jesse, yeah, you me are too. The best. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> All right, this is Shoe Tree, and uh, it's uh, about a, something that happened in uh, St. Mary's, Maryland, Southern Maryland. Shoe Tree, a tree filled with shoes, tennis shoes, hiking boots, running shoes, topsiders, ballet flats, you name it. Impossible to get a precise count. When you shine your flashlight, the branches seem to stir and vibrate in the afterglow of a thousand orgasms. And yet it's just a tree like any other, slick with rain today, leaves beginning to green and hide the shoes, which appear to be waiting for their wings to dry so that they may lift off once the rain ebbs and fly someplace fresh and miles from here. Thank you. And I just want to say we have the 17-year uh, cicada invasion, and that just seemed apt because the cicadas are everywhere. My dog is feasting on them, uh, eating like 100 a day. Ooh. And uh, it's just, it's very strange if you haven't experienced it before. <laughs> Thank you. Great to see Seriously, you. No, no, we don't have them here. But would, would it make him sick? I don't want, want to make him sick. No. <laughs> Okay. Hi, Richard. Uh, Joe Pitkin. Joe, I just saw you there. There you are. Hi, Hi Joe. There. Hi. And uh, again, someone who has a, a, a forthcoming book, but her most recent is the rendering. Mm -hmm. Hold it up. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, there much. You go. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Good. Thanks so much, Jesse and Siobhan and Nessa and Sandy for putting all this together. And I'm thrilled, you can't tell I'm thrilled. It's a rainy, cold day here in the Hudson Valley in New York. So I would have been indoors anyway, but this is just such a treat to hear friends and what, some people who I hope will be new friends in the future. I'm gonna read a short poem from the upcoming book that I'll be having out soon, I hope, um, with Salmon and that is a book called Village Recession. 
It's a book that I wrote during the Great Recession. That was our previous global um, crisis before the one that we've just endured for the past 14 months. So I wrote the book because I needed to deal with the experiences and emotions of watching my then I thought career disappear. It hasn't, but it was such a difficult time economically. And um, I will say that I'm thinking that the ancestors I'm calling up in this poem would be proud of me because I'm pretty sure I might be the only American poet who's done a full length collection about the Great Recession. So maybe I'm not so useless as I felt in this poem. <laughs> so this one is, um, it's about the first um, ancestors I had who came from a little village in Berkhamsted, England, and they came to colonial Connecticut in the 1600s. And I just think I'm celebrating them, but I might be celebrating Jesse's spirit of industriousness and maybe a little bit of workaholism. I don't know, I'm just saying, <laughs> but this is Village the Makers. Makers of boots and shoes by hand, the first American pocket watches by machine, of felt, flour, snuff, cotton, guns and gunpowder, iron, anchors, pipes and boilers, my father's people, makers, makers of glass, olive green and amber flasks and inkwells, my skilled ancestors crafted silver forks, knives, spoons, the kind set out on holidays. Now with air, I make this, lighter than a grain of sand. It won't burn or shatter. You can't eat or sip from it, wear it thin on city streets. But it tells of the maker's ribbed and polished edges their sure making long ago, their swirls, filigrees, metal. Thanks again for letting me celebrate this milestone with you. Oh, thank you, Jill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Daisy, Daisy is just stirring over here. I'd love to turn the thing around so you could see her, but she's trying to get my attention and I think she wants a biscuit. But <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> Peter, oh, Peter Glavicki, there you yeah, are. Hey, hey, Peter. Hey. hey, wonderful to see you all. I'm really delighted yeah. to, to be part of this wonderful experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the Peter's most recent book, yeah, The, the Weight of Dandelions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I um, I wanted to just celebrate uh, Jesse and Siobhan and Ellie and everyone at Salmon and thank them uh, so much for supporting all of my work and for supporting, um, in particular, a collection of haiku, um, which is uh, what the weight of dandelions is. I wanted to uh, read prob probably my favorite poem from the weight of dandelions which is queen size bed, the dog lets me sleep there too. Thank you so much. It also appears in Dog Singing, which is a lovely anthology that Jesse put together. <laughs> oh, thank you, Peter. That was. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Casey, Mr. Paul Casey, I see you. Hi, Jesse. There he is. Paul Casey, hi. The last time I saw you was when um, the, the, the Mac incident, remember? At Christmas, well. poor little Mac, remember? Yes, you do remember. <laughs> In, <laughs> so <clears throat> virtual, virtual Tides is Paul's most recent book with us. So thank you. Thank you, Jesse, and um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you all celebrating Salmon's 40th, you know, which is a huge milestone, as, it, as has been mentioned. So congratulations, Jesse, on all the extraordinary work that you've, you've accomplished. Um, really, you, you make us all very proud. I, I 
Uh, I, for one, and I know many among you, you will feel the same, have felt that one of the great gifts of my life has been the home that uh, salmon uh, poetry has given to my work. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for that. Thank you. Um, I've had a lifelong fascination with languages, as, as Jesse knows, but also with uh, bird song. And um, so they both kind of made their way into this poem in Days of Fair Light. Passerine. Of all the tongues, I'd rather speak bird. Have impulse, thought, and wish tuned into song. For this, I'd give up every poem and word. The flummoxed squirrels think me all absurd, absorbing chorus, verse, refrain, and idiom. But if I had my way, I'd just speak bird. Throughout evolution, this must have occurred to countless sods unable to belong, who vowed surrender every poem and word. All felines I encounter over purr. They trill, insist, yes, something here is wrong. Claws waver, cannot enter this lost bird. I should have sung the circuit I have heard, the notes deep camouflaged inside so long when in a flash I give up every word. As plumage bursts through skin and senses blur, my intuition feels perfectly strong. Of all the tongues, I'd far prefer speak bird. For this, I give up every poem and word. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And uh, with, with, any, with any luck, we'll be able to be back at Oville next year. <laughs> Actually, you know, hugging. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. <laughs> Afric? Afric McGlinchey? Uh, hi, can you hear Afric? me? Afric? Hi. Yep, there you are. Can you, hi. <laughs> hi, how are you doing, Jesse? Um, <laughs> so, um, Afric's most recent book, The Salmon is a Ghost of the Fisher Cat. That was 2012, so you know. 2016. <laughs> okay. Um, so oh, 16, 16. Yes, yes, yes. yes sorry. sorry. It's been a long time. It's a long time. Oh, yeah. no, but I have another one. Yeah. I have another okay. one. Hopefully, hopefully, it'll be. Oh, yeah. I'll Good. be ending it soon. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'm so thrilled and uh, um, thrilled to be part of the Salmon family as everyone is here. And actually this event is fantastic because it's so lovely to see all the faces and hear all the voices and just get a sense of that family in the flesh kind of, or virtually so to speak. And um, anyway, so th congratulations to Salmon and you, Jesse, and to Siobhan and all the team. Um, yeah, I'm so, so glad to be part of that family. Um, my poem, it's a little poem, when, when I uh, was asked by, um, well, by both Nessa and Siobhan to submit, um, I was thinking, what am I, how am I going to write this poem? And I thought, what images come to mind when I think of Jesse? And I, of course, dogs, of course it was dogs, uh, but also the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean and, and your spirit, Jesse. So, um, so I started with that. I just started with a line and then, and then the poem just kind of arrived. I was very lucky. Um, but the other thing was I couldn't think of a title and um, I love those kind of serendipitous things that happen. I was just watching a documentary that night about another uh, trailblazer who was the editor of uh, the Italian Vogue. Um, what was her name? I'm just going to double check here. Francesca Sozani. And that documentary was made by her son and it was called Chaos and Creation. And I thought, perfect that's exactly that epitomized the whole how it all started and all the difficulties that you've described to me and and then just how and then that burst of creativity that just came flying out of the doors of the salmon poetry doors so there was my title so um it's got uh, an epigraph from one of your poems jesse um so it's called chaos and creation and the epigraph is the horizon is both this path and the edge of the sea. Begin with dogs in a boat, dogs in the snow, an open trunk and a laughing dog. Begin with stone walls, a bog, an ocean. Begin with dogs as an opera, like sonata rain on the pavements. Begin with a song, 
and epiphany, that freedom comes from resistance. Begin with a promise, a flung open door, a fine line. Begin with a series of insights, like the dots and dashes, fireflies. Begin with the wild Atlantic and vocals, maracas, nuances. Begin with a killer hook and end with the bright of surprises. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Afric. Thank you so much. Oh, God. Um, oh, um, John, John Murphy. There you are, John. Hi, Jesse. Yeah. And most recent book, Zephyr Vending Machine Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, so it's, okay. The, it, it's the strangest title in the entire 700, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, Jenny, yeah, I, yeah, possibly. I, I, I also wanted to say a, a huge thank you to you and to Siobhan and also to Nessa and to Sandra as well. Um, you are, you're just such a huge part of the Irish poetry world and what you've done uh, for that world is immeasurable, I think. And, you know, I'd just like to say one extra thing about you really, which is how brave you are. You've, you've really taken risks where few would, I think, you know, uh, and that really stands to the, the Irish poetry world. So my poem, um, I took a little, little bit of license with this. I called it Daughter because uh, I know your, your book is Daughter a wonderful collection and um, but my little poem um, it was quite difficult to write um, my own daughter um, got married two years ago um, and she was dead exactly one year after that um, and so this is a little poem about children and about happiness and um, it's about as simple as you know I can make it and uh, it cost me some to write this, I think. Um, daughter, there are stones on the rough track home, sharp enough to hurt your tender feet. And if you look for it, a hard turning that's yours with just enough give for all that you can take. But today the mid mid midday sun is warm on your back and yesterday's rainstorm is forgotten. As for tomorrow, it's just that noisy wind that never blows. And happiness is a child walking with you through the wildflowers whose common names you know. A harvest never reaped, never sown. Happy 40th, Jesse, and continued strength to you and yours. Thank you. Oh gosh, you could be here. That That's wonderful, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Jesse. You. Drew, Drusilla the Wall, there you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm unmuted, right? <laughs> mm, the Geese at the Gates is Drusilla's mm. most recent book with us. The terrific time as well. Mm. Well, hi, everybody. And um, thank you to Salmon, to Nessa, to Alan, to everyone for including me in this. I struggled like uh, others to try to think what can I write that would really uh, do justice to this project and I really felt like I was coming up short so I, but uh, something came to me you know I love to sing and um, we have a couple of grandchildren now the uh, youngest of which had only just arrived last September 1st and um, because of the pandemic and other things, uh, I was doing quite, quite a bit of work trying to help out with kids. And so I was thinking quite a bit about it. And the song, the lullabies, the little things that um, one does for the newest people among us on this earth. And I thought, Jesse, of you as the kind of, I don't know, a kind of uh, empress of song for all of us and for many others who are just coming along now. So this is the poem that I wrote and uh, I guess it was about making connection <clears throat> with this world and uh, the struggles that we have 
and uh, maybe a little sweetness thrown in. So this, oh, and by the way, if I look weird, like I'm squinting at something, I am because I have really bad eyesight. So just so you don't think I'm having a fit or something. So lullaby for grandson Gavin on his seventh week. Smoke from the fires in California has reached us on the Mississippi shore. Hazed sun since morning white ash dressing the garden. It would be four days driving to live embers raining and distant screams of deer and rabbits burning in the blackening hills. Big sister Sweetie Pie is three years old, wears every necklace from grandma's basket as a dance party in granddad's study jingle jangle and nap time is lap time with my little boy blue already in the six month size pajamas rock a baby and read my phone ads just for me dangle earrings that shine like the northern lights but then also the amazing eco jet butt cleaner Rock a rock a baby, rock a rock a roo. Mice sing to each other. We cannot hear them. In wild grasses and leaf litter, they lilt, ending always in an upward note, ultrasonic, recordable. Trees send aid through the fungi of their roots. Mother nourishment vibrates upward in saplings drawn in the network we cannot see. Crowns tower in the canopy just shy of each other. The root embrace is enough. A rock, a rock, a baby. A rock, a rock, a roo. Fish become dogs if you feed them at the boat slip. Their eyes open, mouths flipping up to your hand. Pet them on the head gently, gently, the current swift at the center. A rock, a rock, a baby, a rock, a rock, a roo. Wind cuts from the west across the caged tomato vines. I shield your sister's slender form cupped in my bending body. We are picking all the green ones before the killing frost. Leave the smallest for the squirrels, the rabbits and mice, littles for little mouths, she says. And rock a rock a baby, rock a rock a roo. Filaments twist across the universe, holding galaxies unknown to us. Lullaby, night is rolling ash wind over cold clay. I will keep you hidden from virus, flame, and poison. You will bury me someday. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, Adam. <clears throat> Adam Wyatt? Adam? I'm here. Hiya. Oh, there you are. <laughs> hi. Hi, hey. everyone. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. So, well, yeah, um, Adam's most, most recent book was The Art of Dying. We've also published a few of his um, um, nonfiction, uh, non-poetry, and would, we'll do poetry again. So there, very shortly, in fact. So Adam, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, happy birthday, and it's it's lovely to be here and hear all the wonderful poems. Um, I'm really in complete awe, really, of what Jesse and Siobhan do. Um, they do such fantastic work, and I, you know, I'm always blown away by the amount of uh, American poets. You know, all these new exciting voices are amazing. Um, so I have no idea how you do it. Um, and yeah, I'm just so grateful for the work. That Jessie's done, as she said, she's yeah, published not just poetry collections but essays and plays. She's always open to new ideas and to take risks, and, and I love that. So, 
uh, more power to you both. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to read a new piece um, that I haven't read for, before from my forthcoming collection with Salmon coming out this autumn um, called About Blank. Um, and this work is a, is a four part um, poetic sequence with a blend of narrative, poetry, monologues and dialogue. And I think of it as a kind of dream text or um, if you want to get highfalutin, um, a kind of alchemical memoir of the psyche as it moves across various interiors and episodes and, and mythic dimensions in Dublin. Um, and I was also very lucky to receive the Literature Project Award um, for the books. So I've been developing it with the Abbey and they're turning into this binaural immersive performance um, with Olwyn Ferrer and Darren Rowe. So that'll be out a later this year as well. So I'm just gonna read a, a three minute section from part one, um, which is called Summer's Death Seedful. And this takes place on the, on the Grand Canal, which is just a stone's throw um, from where I live um, here in Dublin. And I've never read this before, as I say, so here goes. Um, this is the way a pane of glass between the beloved and the lover is removed. I came to a bridge over a body of water. I sat down on a bench by the bank and ate my sandwich. The distant sound of a tin whistle tickling my ear. The breeze streaming through the willows, a frozen fountain of flickering leaves. A girl in a crop top lying underneath twisting the lead of her headphones round her finger, tapping her feet, her other hand drawing an invisible circle around her belly, a silent beat. The shaking tree to my right, talking in hushed tones under the breeze, its elephant's hide pushing up against the sky. The shadow branches dancing on her skin are a map of the city. The laid back canal reflecting whatever's thrown at it. Pedestrians, cyclists, bridges, trees, you, me. A dotted line of sleeping bags and tents flap along the bank. Island's new flag, all the way to Google's glass facade. A mute swan glides by, disturbing the water's surface before returning back to the pellucid mirror as if it had never been. The closer we look, the less we can distinguish between surface and reflections, thoughts floating among images second by second, then getting caught in the weeds. An isolated thought rises as a fish into an idea before disappearing in a blank blur below. When the fisher king eats too soon, he suffers a mortal wound. The tin whistle becoming silent, everything still by the water, up is like down when some people want to fill in the blank here, others want to keep it as it is. I'm just throwing crumbs for the pigeons and watching them peck at my feet or setting a black cat among them. Another swan sailed by, this time a flag of peace. An elderly woman sat beside me. I told her my name, but we didn't share the same language. I leaned over and could see her body rippling out of the weeded bank, her sad face reflecting a smile. She held a compact in her hand, as if it were her own life. Something was exchanged in the water, her features refined and redefined by each undulation before settling back. Her body, an old map contained in a glass cabinet through which no words could penetrate, all her treasures locked safe inside. She opened her mouth and a shoal of tiny fish poured out. I was about to respond when a team of terns descended, taking the breadcrumbs from my mouth, then flying off like messengers, passing it on to their young. Do not think you are lost. You are the water and earth that binds us. It comes back. This is the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very, very much. It's very moving. Oh, no. Mary, Medek, Mary, 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 quite contrary, Medek. Mary, Medek. No, where are you? No. 
no. Yeah, hang on. Was here. Yeah, she yeah. was. Mary. To Mary McGick. <laughs> we'll try to get her back. We'll see. What okay, happens. so yeah, I will go on to Mr. Philip Freed, who has published so much with us. Phil. I'm here. Can you hear? Yeah, there you are. Yes, yeah, six, six collections, six collections. And Among the Galatians is the most recent. I'm sorry, so, what? How are you? Yeah, so, okay, off you go. <laughs> I'm honored looking, to appear. I'm looking for I'm honored to appear mm -hmm. in this yeah. I'm deeply grateful to you, Jesse, and to Siobhan for a wonderful book design. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Happy anniversary. Thank you. I'll be reading a poem from Among the Grecians. It's a okay. poem about my own birth during a time of the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. It's called The Battle of the Bulge. Conceived as the world was ripped by cataclysm, I was at first a solipsist, immersed in the amniotic puddle, alerted or lulled by a heartbeat that was jittery or stable, submerged in her and believing we were I. A dog's barking and a lawnmower's drone the music of sporadic conversation and the muffled roar of the crowds at a stadium were part of me and all I knew of war. Sounds without sources heard through her rushing blood. A conscripted soul, I was being equipped with a regulation brain, a spinal cord, and millions of synapses for the liberation. I overheard a radio's Marseillaise reverberating through the bones of her body. Later, I caught the authoritative tones of bulletins on the Battle of the Bulge. And though ignorant of military strategy, I mastered the tactics of flutter and kick. But afloat in her, I couldn't like a soldier crawl on my belly. While GIs froze in the forest called Ardennes, half starved, having outrun their line of supply, I was tethered to mine, crouching in foxholes, or crossing snowy fields into fields of fire, I was snug in her underwater dark. A fetus, I was innocent of the risks of a siege enforced by a German panzer corps and the peril of being deployed in a mother's body or of being born. On December 23rd, the weather cleared, though in her it was still murky and allied planes retook the skies. I drifted on unknowing what was above or below then Patton's armor broke their lines, and I would soon assault the breach in a difficult berth, new blood and guts, the ball at her in the light. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much. It's really good to see you. Yeah. See you. There we are. <laughs> oh, now another person I didn't. Um... Okay, Jerry Henry. Yes, I'm here. Oh, where Hi. are you? Oh, there you are. Hi, Jerry. Hi. Hi. Do you know, I was looking How at are you? Is it really just put two collections with us? But is it really what our shoes say about us? Was that the last one? Is that yeah. the last one we put? Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a long time ago. You've been doing other things, haven't you? Uh, I, you have I, another I got, publisher? No, I got diverted into uh, nonfiction for a little while. But, uh, that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's yeah, true. But, but, uh, yeah. I call it a diversion. So I'm 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 back yeah. in, in the real You're world back again. Back into the poetry now. <laughs> yeah. Good. 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 Yeah. So okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and, and being back in the real world, I'm really delighted to be here tonight and honoured to be here among so many accomplished voices and uh, and uh, very proud to be uh, uh, one of the Salmon family and uh, and to say thank you to Jesse and Siobhan and uh, for, for letting these uh, many accomplished voices be heard. So I'm going to read a poem called Ringo. Uh, it was published, uh, like Peter is earlier there, uh, it, it was published in my last collection, What Our Shoes Say About Us, but um, it was also in Dog Singing, that lovely anthology. So it's a kind of a coming of age poem, I suppose. 
um, when in my early teens or pre-teens, we, we, we took a dog, rescued a dog from, from Dublin's the, the, the dog rescue home and we called the dog Ringo because it was the late 90s and the Beatles. So Ringo, dad said he had the look of a teddy boy and should be sent back to the home. Mom said he was like one of the Beatles with his shaggy black coat and tumbling fringe. Get back reach number one that week, so we called him Ringo Starr. I knew straight off that his rock and roll sneer was a shield, his swagger a defense against the street. He settled right in and was mine. Ringo knew the score and probably chewed gum out back of his kennel while he waited for the neighborhood to heat up. I could tell he knew a lot more than me about girls. An astronaut stepped onto the sea of tranquility and someone was singing about the year 2525. Dad was at home a lot that long winter, spent weeks hammering in the shed. Mom went off to a job somewhere every day. I could hear them talking at night. They sounded cross. Ringo wanted to go exploring by moonlight, so we sneaked off. Spring, and Dad had worked once again. A girl smiled and said hello to me on the bus. I thought about her all week. Friday, and Ringo's bowl lay untouched. That night, he failed to make it home. We worried, but he did have a wild streak. We searched. Dad, myself, a neighbor, nothing. For two nights, his kennel stood empty. A farmer checking cattle saw the black bundle. Drugs in the system with a hint of foul play. A fitting end given his rock star style. We carried him home. Mom planted a shrub and it grew. Ringo. Thank you. Thanks again for having me here tonight. Thank you. Something on my screen. <laughs> thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nessa. Nessa Mahani. Yes, you, I'm here. Will you grace us, please? <laughs> it's, really well. it's, it's, it's lovely to be here. I, um, I'm still here. <laughs> Um, and this is a poem that was included um, in the Days of Clear Light Fesh Shrift. Um, I'm following the, um, the dog theme as it's hard not to. The, the first time I met Jesse, and I think it was in the Unitarian Church at a reading sometime in the late 90s. But under the laden book table, there were two very large dogs. And I knew that this was a woman that I could do business with. And I wasn't a dog owner myself at that stage, but I later became one. Um, so this is based on an event that did happen exactly the way I describe it. It's called Visiting the Publisher, Knock Evan 2014. This is how I remember it. The slow bends up from Doolin, the sky widening, the sense of an edge somewhere a sweep of cliffs when we went too far, missed the turning for the bowring, the donkeyed field. Then a low wall and a bungalow. And suddenly it was all whirl, pulse after pulse of collie energy, nails scrabbling on the floor as the pack raced from one side to the other. You couldn't tell where one dog ended Another began in tail and rump and hair, tongues lolling in juggernaut joy, past chicanes of books and boxes, and back again for yet another circuit. I'm sure there was much to talk about, portents and poets and slim volumes, but I don't remember that. I do recall your smile, your contented shrug, as a leaf blew and the pack took off again. 
Thank you. That's it. It really should be called the, the, the pack of salmon. Only salmon don't do packs, but still. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Zach and Zuki. Mm. Okay. <laughs> He's mentioned dogs and all, get all these, uh, you know, the flashbacks, the memories. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Sound pack, yeah. No, the rat pack. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Dog pack. Okay. Um, no, Celeste. Celeste Ogay. I don't see Celeste either. I'm here. Hello, Celeste. Jeff. I'm here. Oh, 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 oh. Hi, <laughs> Celeste. Hi, okay. hi. And Celeste also has a new uh, book coming with us shortly. And the last one we did, it was also a long time ago. Yeah, skip diving. and. So this would be great. It would be great. You're looking well. This well, is going to be wonderful. Much. And I feel like, um, hello from Connemara. I feel like uh, the Eurovision here with everybody, the, the, the load of people here. It's fantastic. I'm delighted to be here to celebrate 40 years of salmon poetry, which is amazing. And time is so strange because it doesn't feel like it's 12 years since my first salmon collection. And it does not feel like 12 years. Like it really doesn't. So anyway. Um, my next collection with salmon poetry is going to be called I Imagine Myself. And I squeezed it out during my awkward midlife. And I joked at the time of writing the bulk of the poems um, that I hadn't done this much navel gazing since I was a teenager. Um, the collection, um, it, it sort of claims the freedom to have a visible midlife as a woman. And I am going to read a poem of it tonight that, that I think it looks at things that we have in common. It's called, How Are You? Fine. That's what we're supposed to say anyway. We have osteoarthritis or undiagnosed Lyme disease or chronic fatigue or ME or MS or ankylosing spondylitis or asthma or acute allergies or hormonal deficiencies, or unidentified pains in our lower legs, or the lurgy, or the hair ache, or the bottle ache, or man flu. We're in the horrors, or in a heap, or we have gambling addictions, or clinical depression, or a chronic aversion to back chat, chit chat, chin wags, gab fests, or we have migraines, or fibromyalgia, or we're mitered with the sinuses, or we have endometriosis, or we have arrhythmias, or we suffer from broken hearts. Sometimes we need to sleep too much, rest more. We get cranky for no obvious reason. Sometimes we're not happy to see you and it's not because of you. It's the DTs or the fatigue or the, diz or the dizziness or the pains in our bones. And at other times we're happy to see you. In that case, it's definitely you. Sometimes we haven't gotten out of the house in weeks. Sometimes we just need to laugh. On the outside, we look perfect. Two eyes, one nose, two left feet. Normal, or at least the same as most people. A typical human creature. Like most people, we have to lie to get by. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. So good to see you too. See you. See you. Thank you. Um, he, um, sorry, Lorna, Lorna Shaughnessy, another forthcoming book. So you've published, oh, she's published um, three collections with us, Lorna. Indeed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I hope everybody can hear me okay. So I'm also reading a poem from this beautiful book in honor of Jesse. And it's a poem I selected for the book because it's, uh, well, it's from a forthcoming collection, which is going to be called Lark Water. There are lots of larks in it. And the lark is the, the song lark is the soundtrack of an Irish summer, uh, as far as I'm concerned, particularly here in the West. So it's, I suppose it's a soundtrack I know I share with Jesse and uh, I share this amazing coastline with Jesse. And I was really surprised. I went to uh, the uh, Virginia Center for Creative Arts 
fact, a couple of years ago, this time a couple of years ago, actually. And the writers there and the other artists were saying, oh, we do have a song arts in, in, in America, the European species. But I wrote the poem in Virginia, and even though the bird's name are Irish birds, um, Virginia made its way into the poem. Um, it's the freight trains going past at night, and there was the most extraordinary bird song about birds I didn't know the names of. So then there's one. It's a lullaby, and I love Drew's lullaby earlier. So this is another lullaby. Sky lullaby. And it opens with a quotation from Gabriela Mistral, the Chilean poet. The skylark lifts its song so high, you forget how hard it is to die. A wreath of green bird song around your bed, robin, blackbird, finch, and wren. The lark will rise before the sun to draw it up on the thread it has spun for the silken strands of sky and wind. Shot like an arrow from the ground, it halts on high, a bodiless sound that hangs in the air from quavers and fills. There is no smoke in the Skylark's house, no fire to betray its whereabouts, just a cup of grass and hair underfoot. So step carefully through the hours of day, know the lark's eggs are easy prey to the hungry rat and trampling boot. Its only defense is its song to the sun, the quaver in throat, the quiver in lung, as the Merlin wheels its talon hunt. Listen. Darkness has its own strains, the toot and trundle of distant trains, soft chime of keys in the steering air. A wreath of green bird song around your bed, robin, blackbird, finch and wren. The lark will rise before the sun to draw it up on the thread it has spun. Sleep now and wake to its song. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Oh, Susan. Susan Miller Dumar. Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi. 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 Oh, there's Ziggy. Yeah, that's Ziggy next to me. Everybody, everybody sees Ziggy. That's Ziggy. Well, we you we don't... couldn't get our dogs in, but you got Ziggy there. I got the cat in. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Wait, I'll go and get one of the cats. <laughs> Uh, Susan has published loads of books with us, and we hope it's going to be loads more. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yeah, yeah, Naked, New and Selected Poems is her. And what there was a line who, when it was reviewed, Naked, New and Selected, and it was something like um, Susan Miller Dumar, Naked. Remember that? <laughs> that, was a, that was a review headline. <laughs> yeah, that was always going to happen, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you, Susan. So, um, thank you, Jesse. Yeah, um, I think one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me in my life was getting uh, picked up by Salmon. And with every book that I do with Salmon, I more I more know that. Um, and so, from my heart, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, and thank you to everybody, um, all my Salmon folk. Um, it's lovely to be with you. Um, and I also want to say thank you to Sandy and her team, because what they're doing tonight, bringing us all together, they're really making it look easy, and, and it's not. <laughs> Trust me. Um, so thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm going to read a short poem uh, from my mom tonight. My mom turned 80 this month, and she's in hospital, and it's, it's a difficult time for all of us. And so I really wanted to read a poem that is about her that I know that she likes. And uh, I found one. Uh, this is called Philadelphia, August, 1966. It originally was in my second Salmon Collection, Dreams for Breakfast, which came out, I think in 2010. Um, and, oh, and the poem was inspired by the fact that exactly a month before I was born, my parents went to see the Beatles in concert uh, in Philadelphia at JFK Stadium. So the poem is about that. Philadelphia, August 1966 for my mom. I was lucky, wound in the woman with the cat's eye glasses, the chic French twist at the Beatles concert, their last tour, 
a hot day. The band miles away across a field pristine as astronauts' dreams of the moon. Can't buy me love, just a rumble squeak beneath the horny, joyful screams. The young one behind my mother sobs, Paul, Paul. Mom doesn't scream. Her husband beside her pens in his breast pocket, his hair just beginning to lick at his ears. He owns a guitar, my dad. It leans against the living room wall like a moon he plans to visit. Her moon, me. First roundness, first flag on planet family. She steals looks at my handsome father and loves him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She believes in him and he believes in him and the moon is waiting. Anything is possible. And I was made from this. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Gosh, get to Simmons. Simmons Quentin is Simmons. Simmons here? is here. Simmons, where are you? Where, where, I'm, here, you are. I'm here. I'm hey, here. Hey. <laughs> it's been a long time. Too long. Too long. And too long for a book as well. Bloom was Simmons' most recent book. <laughs> and that's a while ago. But, you know, he's very, very busy with terrain.org and with his own publishing, etc. But so good to see you. And I love the background as well. That's, Thank you. You tell where he's. You tell where he's from. <laughs> I am coming to you from the okay. Sonoran Desert here in southern Arizona. Jesse, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Siobhan also and Sandy, thanks for putting together this wonderful event. It's um, it's such an honor and delight to be here reading with all of these amazing poets. And I want to um, read a book since we've been talking a little bit about daughters and uh, we mentioned cicadas. I thought I would read a daughter book. Uh, a daughter poem, excuse me, from Bloom, and um, and it, I think it speaks to the extraordinary um, treatment, extraordinarily great treatment we receive as poets working with salmon. Because Bloom, uh, I had this one poem that had these lines that were just too long to go across one page, and yet I didn't want to break them. So Siobhan had this great idea. Well, let's take this poem, which I'm going to read. I know it's hard to see here. Shower, and we'll put it across the page this way. And so I'm going to read this poem, Shower, but not the traditional way. I'll actually turn my book this way and read that for you. So this is Shower. Our house is full of ladybugs. My daughter has released the whole lot, the profit of an afternoon's unwavering work, busy opals in red and black, black and gray, caught beneath Palo Verde shade and poppy sheath. In the insect box, she lays silver leaves of guava, gentle shoots of yellow sage. As she gathers them one by one, cradled in the warm chalice of her hand, I read Irish poetry and observe the garden. The bluebells are fading. Their indigo petals turn to glass and stain the desert floor. The agave sends a single martyred spike to the sky. Back on earth, she gathers more and more. The bug house is filling, buzzing like a midsummer hive. In my book, spring snow in Dublin and scarves of silver and green. In our garden, she is absolutely floating, 40, glowing like a Chinese lantern, like the sudden hillside of Indian paintbrush, she races inside, opens the box, and showers the room with pure red joy. And that is a true story. Thank you, Jesse and Siobhan. Thank you all. Thank you, Simmons. Thank you so much. It's really OK, fabulous. I don't want to cry. <laughs> Ethna McKiernan? Ethna? 
Edna. No, not there, not there. No. Edna? No, well, I, I'll just move on. She, she's there. Oh, 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 there, hi. 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 There you are. Hello, sweetheart. Hello. <laughs> you good to see you. Yeah, I thought, oh no, she's not there, but you are. Okay. Okay, I'll let I'll let you. Edna's also published quite a few collections with us and has one forthcoming very shortly. Okay. And I will read the very shortly poem that is in Days of Clear Light, Jesse Spestra. This book, by the way, is so gorgeous. Everybody, isn't it? Just, uh, it's beautiful. The illustrations and the book covers. Anyway, I will look for and then read that poem. Also the title of my new book, uh, which is called Light Rolling Slowly Backward. It's August, the season of regret, the season of late beauty brittling on the edge, months before the frost. Crickets drone their low nighttime hum and sadness passes like a light wind through the windows. What is it that we miss? The lilies are long gone, but phlox blooms deep pink and cosmos sway their bright yellow hearts out. It's August and we're hurtling toward November, even as the glory burst of fall color lies ahead. Light rolls slowly backward now while days shorten our shadows grow. In high school, I remember memorizing, Margaret, are you grieving over Golden Grove unleaving? That must be what this morning is, days away from what's to come, even as the crickets chirp their bright summer song. Love, if I knew you, ever found you. Thank you. Thank you, Ethna. <laughs> um, Jude? Oh, Jude, not sure. I'm here. Hi, there you are. Hey. Yeah, Jude goes back a long way, too. We do. <laughs> long, long, long way. We do. <laughs> and this is a kind of a long, a long time getting this one out as well. But, you know, it has a, a, you know, a book uh, coming with us shortly. Dead reckoning. Oh, it's what actually, am I talking about? It's, it's out. just out. It's out. Yeah. yeah. Uh oh, um, is it? That's my bedtime. No. Yeah. Dead reckoning. Yeah. We've dead reckoning. Dead um, yeah. It's. Um, I got a thing from FedEx that's supposed to arrive tomorrow. So, yay! Very excited. Um, thank you, Jesse, for putting this on. Thank you, Sandra. Siobhan, congratulations, Jesse Salmon, for 40 years. It's just brilliant. Um, I'm not in the anthology you put together, so I'm just going to read the first poem from the new collection, uh, Dead, um, Dead Reckoning. And it sort of sets up the whole quest trope that runs through the book. Um, it's set actually in Crag Cave in Castle Island, which some of you might know in Kerry. Um, and I actually went there on the off season and um, I f it was a bit like Dante going into the inferno because I had the guide to myself. I couldn't, I couldn't help but think about, um, you know, the inferno and, uh, and I felt very privileged to be there on my own. So it's called Yanwa, which uh, means in Latin means threshold or doorway. Yanwa, 19th of September, 2016, for my father. Submerging below the fields, thin rind of grass and dirt, following the inclined walkway into and through that liminal territory where heart's tongue and maiden hair and even the saturated flannels of mosses under pressure from ascending darkness surrender and return the limestone to itself. I have entered the earth without dying. I have walked into the open heart of the rock and arrived at the edge of the original entrance. In the light of my torch, a font of water so utterly untroubled, the mind at first perceives it 
as a continuance of air. But far back in the clearness, the tight black gullet of the flooded tunnel. Midweek, off season, I have the guide to myself. But she's flicking on spotlights and prattling on about flowstone and draperies, pool spars, cave pearls. So many words dropping blandly out of her mouth without echo until she ceases her banter and snaps off the spotlights and I hear far off the massive sweating of stone, evidence of rain let slowly go. And my eyes feel strangely opened beneath the roof of the lightless world. Later, when I walk out, nothing at all will be different and everything will have changed. The clouds long ago moved over and a blackbird's cleated call caught still on the air, though the bird itself will be hidden within a new neighborhood deep in the hedge. But for now, in silence, in a clot of torchlight, we are following the meandering path of concrete. We are laboring deeper and the heart, believing it will find what it came for, is one step ahead of reason and ready to cross the threshold until, after weaving through the cathedral and the crystal chamber, after rounding a sudden blind corner beyond the pillar of the limestone Madonna, after coming so far through the hard skirts of the earth, we are brought up short by the strung barrier of a chain link fence. Above us, the long memory of the green world. Around us, the deep unbound pieces of the earth for a while holding still. Beyond the net of the fence, where the bolus of the torch beam widens and bleeds out. Darkness is a door standing ajar. And from this point on, the way untraveled, uncharted, unlit. Every road, every path, every turn I take leads here. And yet, why am I here, Father, if I cannot enter? Thank you. Thank you, Jude. Thank you very much, indeed. Oh, um, now, I have, Ron Houghton unfortunately can't be uh, um, So, Jean, Jean O'Brien? Yeah. Jean. Hi, hi, yes. Hi, 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 hi,
people had. And as a kid, you didn't have your own bike, you borrowed your mother's bike. So it's just on this idea. If I shut my eyes very tight, I can recreate the bike. Your old black bone shaker, its basket hung up front, the paint long dulled and lusterless, the pedals hanging rust encrusted, a wire back carrier tied with twine. If I concentrate even harder, I can see you mount it, shedding years as you push the pedals, wind streaming past your ears, your hair loosed, your skirt a banner unfurled. When you were firmly earthbound again and not watching, I used to sneak a ride, wanting to transform myself, to push against the wind and through it, ringing the bell loudly all the while. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks and have a great evening, everyone. Yes, lovely to be here. Uh, thank you, Jean. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Sheila O'Hagan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jean's what a beautiful, beautiful poet and left us way too early. Uh, Joan McBreen. Now, Siobhan said that Joan might not be here now. Um, Joan? Joan McBreen? No. Oh, well, that's a pity. Yeah, okay. I think she has internet issue problems as well with the connection there. It's in the wilds of uh, County Galway. Um, dear Eamon, Eamon Wall, you better be here. Eamon, Eamon, you were here a minute ago. Yes, Jesse, I'm here. Oh, oh there you are. Yeah. Hello. Hey, sweetheart. Now, again, you see, you've, as I said, we've done this not chronologically, but backwards. <laughs> so Eamon is um, first book was 1994, and we have this. Uh, six collections, and the most recent one, Junction City, New and Selected Poems, and he has another, uh, if we can get the schedule right, <laughs> soon. <laughs> um, okay, Eamon Wall. Okay, uh, thank you, Jesse. Uh, congratulations uh, to you on this magnificent uh, achievement, a magnificent occasion, and many thanks as always to you, Jesse, to Siobhan, to Tim, and Eve and everybody associated uh, with Salmon, not just for publishing seven books through the decades, but also for your uh, friendship and support. And thanks to Nessa and Alan for including this poem in the, in the uh, anthology, uh, Days of Clear Light. And that's the poem I'm going to read uh, now. And I was glad the poem uh, was chosen because it's a poem about another fascination that I have is with uh, Charlotte Bronte and the lives of the Brontes. And of course, uh, the Brontes in some ways remind me of Salmon, uh, people from in, living in wild places, uh, producing uh, wonderful books and uh, changing the world. And of course, as we know, uh, in many ways, but particularly for women poets, uh, Salmon has changed the Irish world in an incredibly important uh, way. Dear Charlotte, a visit to the city. Items gathered from Haworth Parsonage and London's National Portrait Gallery are on exhibit today at the Morgan Library. Miraculously, on Madison Avenue, many sundry treasures are housed as one again. The Bronte materials path-worn to this temporary New York home. 1847, when the great trio by the three sisters first editions under glass today saw light. There are two violinists playing classical in the atrium cafe of the Morgan Library. I wish they could be stopped so I might read uninterrupted Rachel Cuss's outline, this year's must read book. Fortunately today, no TV's evident, so some pause from the endless byline. Looking up then into the emptiness grazing, I see one joyful mother, her child having fallen into sleep, catching that faint breath song of the miracle she is guided into life. Immigrants, we start each day over cereal and coffee, 
boarding buses, chasing parking spaces to the office door, worrying over shoes and hair, hoping to gather again at evening time, sparrows taking flight above our roofs. I have been by Mrs. Gaskell's Life of Charlotte Bronte and your family's many poems and fictions over many decades wandering, mesmerized. We have, all of us, come hither from elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you. I've got a little thing saying your internet is unstable, but that's not, you know, that's not the only thing unstable about me, but, but aren't I lucky? <laughs> Mary O'Donnell, I haven't seen Mary this evening at all. Mary O'Donnell? She is here. She's oh, here. Yeah, she was here. Yeah. Mary. Mary O'Donnell? Mary, she must have gone to get more gin. <laughs> Mary, no? Okay, now, now, um, in the old days of the Salmon Journal, Mary I'll just wait, I'll go back again for a minute. In the old days of the, of the Salmon Journal, we started out as Portugal way as you know, a photocopied little thing. And then we decided it would have to be the Salmon, not the Salmon International Literary Journal, okay, out of Galway when nothing was, anyway. Um, and one of the first American poets, um, there were a couple, I mean, I didn't deliberately go for American poets, by the way. I hated the place when I left in 1970, hated the place and didn't want to go back ever. But, you know, you kind of get, like you get older, like you get in perspective, especially since, you know, the more I became a kind of a, you, you see how you can't actually, you can't really move away from your country. It, no matter what, you know, I mean, physically, yes. And I wouldn't go there again, you know, uh, but, but however, so there were American poets who I, I, I met in, in, in Galway and uh, people like Michael Heffernan and, and Tom Lynch and Knut Skinner and someone then that I published in the Salmon Journal and I shall always absolutely adore. And it came to Galway and we had a very lovely launch with, with, um, with uh, Eva Burke and uh, I, someone I admire tremendously, Paul Ganega. Paul, <laughs> after all that, you better be there. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, yeah, remember Galway in those days. I do. <laughs> do I need to do anything? We published an absolutely, you know, so we published a few of Paul's books as well. But that was the kind of Americans coming to Ireland, that, Amer that, that kind of connection that gave me the idea again of branching out. And after all, Ireland is very small. And if you want to publish a billion people like I do, then you're going to have to move out, out of the country a bit. You know, with so Paul, so good to see you. So good to see you. Thank you. Are you ready? You ready? You, you, your connection's okay. Okay, I'll leave it to you now. Like okay, um, what an honor to be here. Um, what an honor to be part of Salmon. Um, I'm going to read from uh, Days and Flair Life, and. Uh, the poem is 1984, uh, which is just about the time when Jesse and I met, I believe, right around then. Um, and it's very much a New York City poem. Uptown local, 2.30 a.m. Sunday. Guy around my age, Gets on 23rd Street, surveys empty car, sits beside me. Unsure whether to feel flattered or some other kind of edgy, till he pivots, winks, sighs, pulls a switchblade from his pocket, flicks blade open, pushes it back into handle, 
flex blade open, pushes it in handle, all the while smiling, busy secret smile, not so very different from man carrying a cello, gets on at Penn Station, trundles to the far end of the car, from bickering couple that storm aboard at Times Square, Mohawk teen with birdcage, deer trick drag, him never stopping, flicking the blade, smiling, flicking the blade, smiling, when he leans over and announces in confidential tone, I am Jesus. I can do whatever I want, anything at all. And I, with breathless effort, twist lips into what I hope passes for a non-agnostic grin. And despite stares insisting they see nothing from those who joined our ride, and despite the urge to flee the next stop or the next, I somehow stay put all the way to 110th Street, where, ungluing myself from the seat, I leave switchblade Jesus on his eternal journey to the Bronx. Whistle walk three frozen dark box home. Roar of his goodbye beneath the subway grate. New York prayer stuck in my gut. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. You're gonna have to come over again. I'm looking you forward and Jim, to it. You're gonna have to come over to Ireland. Stay in the bookshop. Do millions of readings. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, now, Mary, Mary O'Donnell is, Mary is here somewhere. Mary? Mary? I can hear her very faintly. Yeah, she needs to, Mary, you need to turn your sound up a lot. Can you hear us, better. Mary? Is that any better now? Yes. Oh, yes. there you are. Oh. Yes. Okay. yes. Oh. I had my I had my head. Sorry about that. I oh. had my headphones in, and I thought you'd be able to hear me just fine. Well, can you see me? <laughs> so no, Mary okay. also Thank just you. has a new book, oh, "Massacre of the Birds." It's Mary's latest collection, and also someone who goes back a long way with salmon. Yeah, reading the sunflowers in September. <laughs> That was what, that was 80, 80, 80, e. Was it 89 or 90? 90, I think. 90, 90, yeah. Wow. So hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, look, uh, I just want to say thank you to Jesse and Siobhan, Sandra and everybody involved in tonight's wonderful gathering. Um, it has been great to be published by Salmon Poetry uh, because Jessie always delivers what she says she will do. And that is a wonderful quality, which I really appreciate. And um, so I thank you, Jessie, for all the nourishment you've brought, not only to me, but to Irish publishing. Um, even when years ago, some of these idiots didn't quite get it, but I think they do now. <laughs> so, um, I'm just going oh, to read I've, one. I've, yeah, I've stopped caring, Mary. I, I don't well, care. Well, nothing. If yeah, it's not, not relevant. We just go it's on. Not relevant yeah. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you know. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm just you. going to read a poem from from my first collection, reading the sunflowers in September. Um, now that's partly because I'm in my mother's home in Monaghan and I don't have a copy of Massacre of the Birds with me. So I'll read this one. It's called Cycling with Martin. And um, 
I'm reading it thinking of my husband of almost 44 years now and how we were then. So this harvest we were across terrain once dreamt of, cautious immigrants in the land of forgotten love. Miles breeze past our heads, unfasten a week's tidy thoughts as we eye the possibilities in tumbling thickets or sample blackberries, find more than sweetness, a reckless tang bruising the lips. I sample your body on such trips, draw urgent images from leaves, long pushing mushrooms, flaming rosehip, idle on the hours we've spent, the heat of your buttocks as you break within me. Wind flown now, the bikes shear down the last stretch. This body autumn I quicken, feel vintage warmth in the sun, unsprung from myself as the year drowses. Hungry for peaches and plums, flesh lustily cloven, I repeat my cyclist's mantra, brute labials like love, my love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everyone. Um, now, I don't think Jeffrey Levine has surfaced. Uh, I see Kevin Higgins here, but I don't suppose you've got a, a poem tucked up your sleeve, Kevin. No, I no? read at the previous event. Okay, but it's very I'm good I'm far too shy anyway, far too shy. Are you Are you too shy? <laughs> I know. Yeah, um, uh, the, oh, uh, and Joan, Joan McGreen still, no? Oh, okay, as I say, that brings us to the end of our evening. But I've got this book here, walking here, which is my thing. I, um, do you know, I, um, uh, I've only, I've done two, two collections of poems. Well, three, if you count. Um, well, first was Daughter, which is a long poem about the death of my mother. And then, and then I did Daughter and Other Poems. And then, uh, and then this one, and, and then some anthologies you know, uh, dog singing and the various books on poetry, reading it, writing it, stuff. But I think, you know, I, I think that if I was uh, now, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really a sexist, but I think if I was a, not really, <laughs> I think if I was a man, I would have published something in the region of 10 books of mine by now, you know, but being, being a lady, uh, brought up to be a nice girl and to give in to uh, Sandy, don't look like that. And get, get, you know, you know, brought up, especially my generation, uh, uh, to be, you know, you do things for other people and you don't do things for yourself and you don't speak well of yourself. That was, of course, my Southern Baptist upbringing too. Uh, but you know, fuck it. Um, I um, I just always did what I wanted to do. And the, the old gender didn't matter an awful lot, did it? <laughs> so I, uh, I have this, but my mother, you know, my, my um, is I'm from Arkansas. The first thing I remember, cotton fields. We didn't actually have a farm. Uh, we were renting, but my mother picked cotton for other people. And my father of the alcohol, um, of the, <laughs> the Irish lineage, <laughs> Uh, that was his excuse for being uh, a heavy drinker. Uh, and, uh, but one of my earliest memories then would have just been of cotton fields. And uh, so this is from walking here and it's for my mother and her birthday would be today. Um, uh, she died when she was 50 and I was 14 anyway. Okay, this is called cotton. For my mother, Willie Mae Harbin Lindeni, would it have interested you to know that cotton blooms in the valleys of the Amu Darya River? You would remind me of cotton fields which stretched to the, stretched to the horizon in the Mississippi Delta when you were my age with seven kids. You would remember the way the men <clears throat> weighed the sacks 
and the coins in exchange. Now without you, I am intrigued by names of places where cotton grows so far away, like my early awareness of hot sun and sweat and your broad brimmed hat above me. That's... So thank you guys for everything. I, um, it's just stunning to me, you know, you're all so wonderful, seriously. And uh, even if I'm not the best at keeping in touch about things, I do love you all. <laughs> and uh, okay, well, Sandy, you had some, is that what we, you were, you were going to wrap up, Sandy? Okay. Yeah, I'll do a little wrap up. But first, uh, before I do my little wrap up, um, how about everybody just unmuting and showing your appreciation once again for Jesse, uh, for Siobhan, a happy, happy birthday, birthday to Jesse's mom, and, and, and to all of our readers. Happy birthday. Today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you, Jesse. Happy birthday. Thank you, Jesse. 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 Sandy, you're muted. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. I want to just say what a delicious, moving, filling afternoon for me now. A uh, day of poetry from these salmon poets across the decades. And I hope that everybody today who's been here for this extravaganza of poetry, uh, that, that this gathering has given you an appreciation of the wealth of lives devoted to poetry and a poet herself devoted to bringing those voices forward in Jesse Lendenny. What a journey that has changed the course of poetry in Ireland and elsewhere. You know, with each poet, Jesse, that you've reached out to to publish and to those of us all who continue to read all those poems and poets over time. I want to just remind you all that we've been here today to celebrate um, really the 40 years of salmon poetry and most recently collected in Days of Clear Light, Fetrift in honor of Jesse Lendenny and in celebration of salmon poetry at 40, edited by Nessa O'Mahony and Alan Hayes. And you've also heard from just a few of the 700 plus books that Jesse and Siobhan have supported uh, all these years and, uh, and will continue to manifest. Uh, I wanna also give a special thanks today uh, to Nessa, uh, who has most recently has published, uh, is the editor, co-editor with Alice Kinsell of Empty House, Poetry and Prose on the Climate Crisis. Uh, thank you so much for giving us that overview of time that has been Salmon Poetry's journey. And again, uh, I want to thank all of the beloved Salmon Poets today, really with a wish for each one of you, uh, a reminder that you look at yourself in the mirror each morning, see yourself and remember that the beholder is the eye of grace. Poetry brings us a lot of grace and you are the beloved bringers of that grace to us through your words and your spirits and your humanity. Thank you for gracing us with your poetry today and for being connected through time and space and salmon, that transatlantic connection that poetry travels back and forth and back and forth. Again, poetry transmitted. We hear all your voices and look forward to the next time we gather.
Well, I'll end today. Um, my heart is just so full with a, just a little sneak preview of what's up to come in, uh, coming up in June with us here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Next week, actually join us on the theme of the Anthropocene with uh, Sudeep Sen and Spires, D. Allen and Ju Pong Lin and the live open mic. Please feel free to join us, bring your poems about climate justice and climate change. Our new book showcase will follow June 13th with the works of Patricia Carrigan, Bill Fay, Angela Driven, and Anne Walsh Donnelly joining us over from County Mayo. And June 20th is our tribute to Juneteenth, welcoming poet and historian Kim Roberts with her latest anthology, edited her, her edited latest anthology by Broad Potomac Shore. Great poems from the early days of our nation's capital with some special guest readers. And then finally on June 27th, it's the return of our Poetry Pride Parade featuring the amazing, amazing voices, Charlie Dale, Kay, Kai Coggin, Ann Walsh Donnelly will be joining us, Mark Ward, one of our Salmon brothers, Charles Flowers, Gustavo Hernandez, Mary Oishi, Karen Poppy, Minnie Bruce Pratt, Julie Marie Wade, Mark, uh, Mark Ward, as I've mentioned, and other LGBTQ poets and their allies, and possibly you with us live on the open mic. Well, again, everyone, what a very moving day. I wanna thank you all for joining us. Thanks to Don Krieger and, and to Kim Ports for your support today and uh, sending you much peace and love from, whenever, from wherever you are joining us today. Until then, my friends, ahoy, safe <laughs> travels and keep right. Thank you, Sandy and Kim. And yeah, and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.